sit tight because it's time for Good Game Spawn Point. I'm Jem. I'm Rad. And I'm Will. Coming up on today's show, what do you get when you combine a wizard, a knight, and a thief? You get our review of Try and Fall the Nightmare Prince. Plus, we've got the cartoon mayhem of ukulele and the impossible lair. That game is kind of a spiritual successor to the Donkey Kong Country series. Ah, Donkey Kong, truly the king of video game apes. Well, except for Frank. Who? Hey. Last, the enchanted heroes of Trine were together again. Trine 4 The Nightmare Prince is a 2.5D puzzle platformer, the latest addition to the Trine series, and I'm gonna say it, one of the prettiest games I've played this year. Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Something straight out of a fairy tale with a story to boot. Our tale begins where all good tales do at the beginning. You're introduced to three noble-ish heroes, Amadeus the Wizard, Zoya the Thief, and Pontius the Knight. They're contacted by the head of a magical order to locate and return Prince Celius, who, because he can't keep his royal mitts off anything, has unleashed a supernatural power that brings nightmares to life. Ooh. So in the life of a hero, though, a typical Tuesday. As you traverse these wide lands, you'll have to overcome all manner of obstacles. To do this, you'll need to utilise the skills of each hero. Amadeus can use his talents to lift objects in his way and conjure magical items that can be used as a counterweight or help you to reach high places. He is probably the most useful character, in my opinion. I don't know about that. Zoya can use her bow and arrow to cast a rope, which can be used to swing over large gaps, create bridges between objects, and break items out of reach. She's fast, agile, and incredibly cool. Last but not least is Pontius, kind of like the heavy of the group. He can smash through obstacles, enemies, and deflect projectiles with his shield. So everybody's got their own special something. In single player, you'll be switching between these three characters to solve each of the puzzles in your way. These aren't overly complicated in the early stages as you get to grips with each of the characters' abilities, but as you progress, they do get more complex, adding in more elements to tackle. Not difficult enough to keep any master puzzlers down, but I found them meaty enough to keep me interested. Playing in co-op mode is a different kind of difficulty entirely as you wrangle players together. The puzzles do change to add a bit more bite and keep you from locking yourself or your friends out, but you'll still probably breeze through the majority of the campaign. As you progress, you're drip-fed new abilities and upgrades for each hero, which you unlock through their respective skill trees. These really kept things feeling fresh, with each new ability changing the way I'd approach later puzzles, rather than just being granted and forgotten about. Zoya can use her elemental arrows to freeze objects in place. Amadeus can use enemies as shields. And Pontius can, well, he just keeps destroying things in flashier ways. He's doing his best. In fact, he's actually at his best when it comes to the combat, where he is just an absolute wrecking ball of destruction with his charge attacks. The nightmarish monsters you'll come across vary in shape and size, but all are out for blood. Unfortunately, the fights themselves aren't really that interesting or challenging. In fact, I had more trouble wrangling the controls than I did actually fighting the monsters. Aiming and firing Zoya's arrows felt particularly fiddly in these tense moments, which would often land me in deep trouble. Yeah, this is one of the few instances where I honestly didn't need any combat. It just felt like such a drag. But on the plus side, it does give you more time to spend in the world's gorgeous environment. I took so many screenshots, I've got desktop backgrounds for days. There's such a beautiful variety in landscapes, from moonlit forests to sun-kissed gullies. And it's all scored to a wonderfully whimsical soundtrack. But as they say, looks aren't everything. What do you think, Will? I think if you're a fan of the Trine series, this is a major step up. For the most part, everything feels tight, flows together nicely, and the puzzles have enough pieces to work through that you feel a sense of accomplishment when you put them together. I'm giving Trine 4 the Nightmare Prince three and a half out of five rubber chickens. There's so much charm packed into such a small amount of time, and there's a lot of fun to be had with it. But apart from its visual style, which in case I haven't mentioned, I loved, there isn't a lot to set itself apart from other arguably better structured puzzle platformers. So I'm giving Trine 4 the Nightmare Prince three and a half out of five rubber chickens as well.
Good morning, Australia. It's time for the scoop with me, Darren. Joining me this week, one of GGSP's three game skateers. It's Red. Oh, thanks, Darren. Great to be here as always. <gasps> now fire up those frontal lobes. It's time for Darren's challenge. <laughs> the name of this Pokemon gym leader. Oh, another spicy challenge there, Darren, especially given the name of the city this gym leader is based in. <gasps> Answer at the end of the scoop. Now for some gaming news. Speaking of Pokemon, a new Pokemon has been revealed. The Galarian Ponita is a so-called unique horn Pokemon with a colorful glowing mane. It will be exclusive to the upcoming Pokemon Shield, which is due out along with Pokemon Sword in November. Oh, it sure will be tough to decide between Pokemon Sword or Shield. Uh, what's your preference, Darren? Well, sometimes a good defense is the best offense, so maybe Shield. Oh, but then again, swords are shiny. I can't decide. <laughs> Moving on, and now that pet monkeys and parrots have made their way into Sea of Thieves, Rare has released the most popular in-game pet names. The top ten name list includes monikers like Jack, Rafiki and Polly. More than 150 players also named their pets Joe Neat after the game's executive producer. Oh, I'm surprised that Boatmeal didn't make the list. <laughs> Affirmative! I think Boatmeal would be a great pet name in Sea of Thieves because of all the sailing. <laughs> Get it? Boats? <laughs> um. In other news, the US TV quiz show, Jeopardy, seems to have fallen for a gaming-related internet joke. The clue appeared to take a social media joke from earlier this year as fact. The joke being that the Tetris blocks have names, like Orange Ricky, Hero, and Smash Boy. Humans can be so gullible. <laughs> You're right, Boatmeal. That would never happen on Darren's challenge. <laughs> now, shall we have an extra scoop? What do you have for us, Rad? Well, Untitled Goose Game has clearly taken the gaming world by storm, inspiring all sorts of creativity. One of my personal favourites is a player known as Rudism and his custom costume controller. He adapted the controls to enable voice-activated honking, motion-controlled wing flapping and feet-activated waddling. It works! It works! Oh, splendid! You might remember Rudism from his previous custom controller antics, like playing Tetris with an eggplant. Ah, uh, who could forget? <laughs> now for the answer to Darren's challenge! This Pokemon gym leader is... Sabrina! Ah, uh, yes, Sabrina from Saffron City. She specialises in psychic-type Pokemon, if I remember correctly. Affirmative. And that's all we have time for this week. Until next scoop, good night, Australia. Uh, do you ever think there'll be a robot-type Pokemon? Oh, I don't see why not. Perhaps one could be named after me, a, a Darbot. A Charadar. Or a Psydaz. It could be psychic and robot. Oh, that's too powerful. Uh, negative. <laughs> Yuka and Laylee are the plucky chameleon and bat duo who made their video game debut back in 2017. And now they've returned for another platforming adventure in The Impossible Lair. Now, some of you may know that Ukulele is the work of many of the same developers who help create games like Donkey Kong Country and Banjo Kazooie, games that help define the platforming genre. And if Ukulele is the spiritual successor to Banjo Kazooie with its sprawling 3D worlds, then this new game is an ode to the days of Donkey Kong Country with its tight and tricky side scrolling platforming. Story wise, the nefarious Capital B is back to his old no good tricks. Invading the royal stingdom, attacking Queen Phoebe, and trapping her royal bee Talion in an evil plan to use a hive mind device and enslave the whole stingdom. Yes, there's a lot of bee puns here. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Oh, let's not. Oh, honey, don't be such a buzzkill. I'm just gonna move on, okay? 
That stings. So there are two halves to this game, with 40 levels tied together through a big overworld. Well, technically, there's 20 levels, but each has an alternate version you unlock by completing puzzles in the overworld. For example, by flooding an area, you'll get a new version of that level that's filled with water. Yeah, I was impressed with how different they are to the standard levels, too. And the level design is great. There's satisfyingly speedy sections and more methodical areas that will put a whole range of platforming skills to the test. Plus, there are lots of clever hidden areas and collectibles to grab which reward exploration and repeat playthroughs. I particularly like the different quill ghosts you come across. These guys throw a few different challenges at you, like having to chase one down in a specific time limit. But my favourite is the one that just literally spews quills. Whilst the platforming is great, I actually think I enjoyed the overworld stuff a bit more. It's a nice place to explore and find secrets, and the puzzles are genuinely satisfying. Yeah. yeah. And I think they've also done a great job making all the collectibles worthwhile, too, with each having a practical use and effect on the game. Now, Rad, would you say this is a difficult game? Uh, mostly no, though there are some tough moments. Yeah, there are some difficulty spikes. Some sections left me borderline raging. They do let you skip sections when you've died a bunch of times, but my pride never let me do that. I think it's forgiving enough overall, though, with lots of checkpoints and infinite lives. Oh, and I like how Laylee acts as an extra hit point. When you get hit once, she panics and flies off, but you have a brief chance to grab her back. It's a nice way to get a second chance at a second chance. And if you do lose her, gone is your float ability and buddy slam attack, which are needed to get into lots of the secret areas. I sometimes wonder if the designers are kind of trolls at heart. There's always something tempting you to try and pull off a tricky move, and it rarely ended well for me. It is nice how much they let you tweak the difficulty, though. In the overworld, you can find special tonics, some of which make things easier by adding more checkpoints, granting special abilities like slow-mo or screen-clearing bombs, or just improving your movement abilities. You can apply three of these at once, too, and eventually a fourth slot can be unlocked. But the easier you make things, the less quills you get per level. However, they can also earn you more quills if you're willing to make things harder by giving enemies more health or messing with your controls. That was pretty clever. Speaking of difficult bits, the main objective here is to beat Capital B's Impossible Lair. And as you might expect from something called an Impossible Lair, it's hard. Like, take what you're thinking of how hard it is right now and double it. And then it's ten times harder than that. It's a super long and punishing gauntlet with multiple boss fights, no checkpoints, and you can't use your tonics. Thankfully, though, at the end of each level, there's a member of the battalion you can rescue, and each one you free gives you an extra hit point in the impossible lair. I'm sure there's going to be some crazy good players who manage to blast through the lair with no bees for backup, but I will not be one of them. Did you manage to finish it? Oh, yeah, of course. Easy beezy. That's a lie, isn't it? I'll be honest, this part wasn't much fun for me. It's so long and so punishing that after a few attempts, I just didn't want to spend another 10 minutes doing it all again, only to get crushed and sent back to the start. Yeah, for now at least, I must admit defeat. Capital B has won, the Stingdom is doomed, so be it. Was that a B pun? No, no, I said the word B, like B-E, not buzz buzz. Nah, that was a B pun. Oh, all right, let's wrap this up. What are you giving it? Well, there's a lot to like here, with tight and precise platforming and buckets of charm and character. And it also has some amazing music. I may not have beaten it, but it still left me buzzing. I'm giving Ukulele and the Impossible Lair four out of five rubber chickens. It kind of feels like a modern retro classic, if that makes any sense. It certainly packs a sting in its tail, but the rest is as sweet as honey. It's a four from me as well. Those were bee puns. All right, no need to drone on about it really earning your stripes, flowering into it. OK, well, it's time for another round of Ask SP Questions. It sure is. Wherever there are gaming questions out there, it is up to us to find the answers. So let's start off with this video one from Ollie. Hi, TZSP. I've got two questions for you. Number one, how long does the battery on the Switch last? Number two, how... Why aren't meerkats in Minecraft? Thanks, Ollie. In answer to your question about the battery life of the Nintendo Switch, well, you know who loves batteries and talking about batteries? Uh, Darren? Darren, indeed. Let's give him a ring. 
Greetings, Darren speaking. Hey, Darren. We just have a video from Ollie who's asking about how long the battery on the Nintendo Switch lasts. Oh, well, that all depends. If you have the original model of Nintendo Switch, the battery life is said to be between two and a half and six and a half hours, depending on the game you're playing. Different games can use different amounts of battery power, and other functions can affect the battery too. Right, but I heard there were some updates to the Switch that improved that. Affirmative. Newer units of the Switch, which became available mid-August of this year, have an extended battery life. So it is said to last between four and a half and nine hours, again, depending on the game. This is not to be confused with the handheld Switch Lite, which is said to have a three to seven hour battery life. Right, well, informative as always. What's your battery life like, Darren? Oh, well, I have multiple power sources, so I won't be running out of juice anytime soon. <laughs> Lasers for days. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, thanks, Darren. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, as for why there aren't meerkats in Minecraft, here's what I know. In the lead-up to last year's Minecon, the devs talked about a possible update to the desert biome, which would include meerkats. Players were asked to vote for which biome would be updated first, and Tiger was the one selected. So I think they still plan to update the desert with meerkats someday, but aside from the odd mod, there might still be a while to wait before it officially happens. Yeah, and for this year's Minecon, there was another vote, but for three different biomes, and the mountain biome won that vote. So the mountains update will probably happen even before the desert. Well, let's just hope they don't desert their plans to update the desert completely. Well, now I'm hungry. But yes, let's hope. Now on to another question, and this one is from Rachel in Adelaide, ACT. Hi, GGSP. What is your fab Marvel game? Thanks, Rachel. Well, it's no secret that I'm a bit of a Marvel fan, and if I had to choose a favourite Marvel game, I'd say maybe LEGO Marvel Super Heroes 2. It's just a real celebration of all things Marvel. The Spider-Man Far From Home VR experience was also pretty fun for a short play. What about you, Jem? I actually quite enjoyed Marvel Strike Force. I was pleasantly surprised by how good it was for a free mobile game. Ah, uh, yes, good choice. Now moving on, and this one comes from Henry in Wodonga, Victoria. Hi, Henry. Hello, GGSP. I have three questions for you. One, how do you get 9,999 coins in Super Mario Odyssey? Two, how many moons do you need to go to the darker side? Three, is Wreckfest a two-player so I can play with my dad? All hail King Bowser! Thanks, Henry, but wait a minute. Why would you hail King Bowser? Bowser is a baddie. Maybe he meant Doug Bowser, who took over as the head of Nintendo in America recently. Mm, I hope so. Anyway, if you're trying to get 9,999 coins in Super Mario Odyssey, well, aside from picking up as many coins as possible across all kingdoms, there is a trick to help you get there. Oh, yes, I've heard about this. There's that special section in Bowser's kingdom that you can play over and over to boost your coin count. That's right. Now, to get to this special section, head to the Beneath the Keep warp point in Bowser's kingdom. Once you're there, turn around, away from the big gate, and head for the rooftop on your right. Go over the top, then go down to the lower rooftop to your left and towards the golden rings. These will guide you down to another platform alongside a purple pool. Head to your right and drop down again to another rooftop area where you'll see a seed. Pick up the seed and carry it past the spiky obstacles, throw it into the pot and climb up the vine that grows. This takes you to a special bonus spot above the clouds. There are a couple of power moons up there, but it's also a great place to collect coins. And the key to maximising the amount of coins you can collect here is not to move the joystick in any way, right? Exactly. You'll be lined up to collect all the coins in front of you from the start. So all you have to do is throw Cappy at the flower bunches for the boost and jump between platforms when necessary. Once you reach the end, you can go back for the seed and repeat the process as many times as you like. Of course, this is still a bit of a grind, and I wonder if it's really worth it personally, but if you don't mind the repetition, it looks like you can bank about 180 or so coins per run. Now to how many moons you need to get to the darker side. You'll need at least 500 moons, and you'll need to have completed the main story, of course. As to your question about Wreckfest, well, while Wreckfest does have online and land multiplayer, it does not have split-screen local multiplayer. Which means you could play with your dad if, say, you were on two different PCs and both connected via your home network. 
Well, I guess if you had two separate consoles and two copies of the game on two TVs... Well, maybe you and your dad could play together, but just take turns instead. Yeah, that could work. Well, I think we're out of time for today. If you have a question for us here at Ask SP, head to our website here and send it in. And, of course, if it's a video question we choose for the show, we'll send you a GGSP goodie pack. Be quick about it, though. There's only six episodes left for the year. Ooh, gotta go fast. So fast! Well, we're all out of time for this week, but next time on GGSP... It's spooky season. We're going to celebrate Halloween with reviews of Luigi's Mansion 3 on the Switch... <laughs> ..and Concrete Genie on PS4. Oh, did you know I'm working on a special Halloween costume? Nah, you're not going to come as a computer virus again, are you? Uh, not telling. I've got my eye on you, Darren. Now, don't forget to catch up with our online-only review this week. Will wrangles with the wacky physics of What the Golf. It's weird and wonderful. Well, until next time, be nice, have fun and keep gaming. Rat out. Will out. Gem out. Darren out.